Now, educational empowerment was for this community more than just a moral cause. It was also quite instrumental. You see, growing up in the circumstances of the segregated South, where you couldn't go to a restaurant, where your parents had to find a way to tell you that the reason you couldn't go to that movie theater was that you were black, where your parents had to explain why it was, as a friend of, little friend of mine, uh, parents had to, that you couldn't go to Kittyland. You can imagine that that might have been uh, an environment in which people felt oppressed and victimized, marginalized, and where horizons would have been limited. Well, education was, from their point of view, the answer to that. Because if you could speak English better than they did, meaning the white men, if you could cite, recite their literature better than they did, if you could play their music better than they did, then they might not like you, but they had to respect you. And you could build a life that was fulfilling and productive and a life of dignity. And for, therefore, for the families and the people of segregated Birmingham, education was a kind of armor against racism and prejudice that allowed them to build uh, this productive and dignified life. They believed um, uh, that you might not be able to control these circumstances, but you could control your response. And you were better able to control your response if you were educated. In these communities, the highest regard was held for teachers and for principals. If you were a teacher in the Birmingham public school system, oh my goodness, you had arrived. The day that a family learned that their son or daughter had received a teaching job was a happy one for them. And you should have seen the uh, event that was the new teachers conference every year held at the Civic Center in Birmingham with every teacher, every new teacher in suit and tie, the women in hats and gloves. It was quite a moment for the Birmingham community. And oh, by the way, as my uncle found out, it was also a great way to meet a mate. That's how my uncle met his wife at the new teachers conference. The principals were even more gigantic figures. People like Mr. R.C. Johnson, the principal of Parker High School, the largest high school in Birmingham, and the father of Alma Johnson Powell, Colin Powell's wife, and Mr. George C. Bell, her uncle, by the way, who was the principal of Ullman High School. And even the principals of elementary schools were considered towering figures, like Mr. W.W. W. Whetstone. When Mr. Whetstone uh, unexpectedly died of a heart attack, the funeral that was head, held for him rivaled anything that you would see for a great political figure now. My point in relaying this is that the profession of educating was also valued above all else. You had a few doctors and you had a few lawyers, but not so many in the segregated South. But to be a teacher, this was the highest calling. In return, these teachers expected the best of their students. Uh, to be in a classroom where you were told you will have to be twice as good, not as a matter of debate, but as a matter of fact, teachers expected the highest uh, performance. They tried to help those who could not perform, but the high standards were held, uh, you were held to account to high standards. You were told there are no victims and no excuses. Now, this narrative that I've related to you, I hope helps people to understand why in a place like Birmingham, with all of those circumstances of prejudice, all of those circumstances of limited horizons, so many very, very successful people emerged. And it says something about our challenge today in making certain that the talented 10th are not just the children of the educated and the children of the well healed, but in fact that education as the great equalizer is available so that the talented 10th represents a broad section of the United States and a broad section of our diversity and uh, of within uh, the race. It's essential 
uh, for the United States that this be true. And of course, the key to this is K-12 education and whether or not children are actually able to access those educational benefits. Today, I have to say I am concerned about this when I can look at your zip code and tell whether or not you're going to get a good education. And I will tell you that this is terrifying to me. First, it's terrifying to me as an educator because I realize that without access to education, we are never going to know whether the potential of the person who might have found the cure for cancer is being sacrificed because they never had that chance. It is, for me, terrifying as an educator because I love to stand in front of a class at Stanford, and I'm sure you can do so at Harvard, and see that on the one hand, there is a fourth generation Stanford legatee, and sitting next to that kid is an itinerant farm worker's son. Now, without a K-12 education, and I mean public school education, the chance that that will continue to be the composition of a class for Stanford or for Harvard is very slim. That will mean that for the United States of America, and here my concern goes from being that of an educator to being that of a former Secretary of State, it means that our competitiveness as a country is clearly at risk and our ability and willingness to be open to the world is clearly at risk. You see, if we try to hold on to the days when the $18 an hour unskilled labor job was the way that you have made a decent living in the United States, we're not going to be able to do it. The truth is that the United States occupies in the global economy that upper tier where knowledge and the ability to create and innovate is at the core of whether or not you're going to get a good job. Ask the people on Route 128, ask the people in the Silicon Valley if they can find enough engineers and they will tell you no. And so somehow the creation of an educational system in which people can get the skills that they need is very important. Otherwise, the United States will not lead, it will turn inward, it will try to protect and we will never be able to protect as effectively as others can protect. And the economic pie will get smaller, not larger. And so as Secretary of, a former Secretary of State, I worry about the competitiveness of the United States and the willingness of the United States to look outward and to lead. So as an educator, it's the loss potential. As a former Secretary of State, it's the loss of leadership. But as an American, I worry about one other thing. This great national myth that it does not matter where you came from, it matters where you're going, that you can come from humble circumstances and you can do great things, is what unites Americans. America is an idea. It's not, as we discussed yesterday, a nation state. To be an American is to be from multiple, multiple ethnic and national backgrounds. It's to be from multiple religious backgrounds or no religion at all and to still be an American. That belief in upward mobility, as it's sometimes called, in a better life for the next generation, explains in large part why Americans embrace their unity and embrace their great national idea. Now, if in fact that great national belief is no longer true, particularly for the least of our kids, particularly for the child who needs the public schools to have that child read at third, le third grade level by the time they're third grade. If that's not available to those children, we risk the rending of the fabric of the society. Since it is really that thread that holds us together, if we break that thread, then our optimism and our confidence and our sense of who we are is going to disappear very, very quickly. We're fortunate that we don't have a great national myth that makes us hang on to the past. Like so many countries in the world, trying to hang on to something that happened hundreds of years ago to unite them. 
Our great national myth has always united us about the future, that the future is going to be better for the American people than the past was. The key to that is whether or not people can access the great transforming power of education. I think that W.E.B. Du Bois was very wise to focus on how black America might be led by a talented 10th to do much better under even very difficult circumstances. But it is not just a challenge for black Americans. It is a challenge for Americans as a whole. Thank you very much.